Hello, my name is Gabriel Barthmarin, and together with Jackie Kay, we'll be presenting A Generalist Agent on behalf of our co-authors listed here. We'll begin by talking about the model, how we convert data into embeddings, the architecture used, and how we calculate the training loss. Next, we'll discuss the different data sources we used for training and fine-tuning models. Jackie will discuss our in-distribution, a few shot out of distribution and robotics results. And finally, Jackie will show our work on visualizing and interpreting attention masks. This image shows a succinct overview of the generalist agent, also known as Gato. Gato is a multimodal, multitask, multi-embodiment generalist policy. The same network with the same weights can play Atari, caption images, chat, stack blocks with a real robot arm, and much more. Deciding based on its context with a type of text, joint torques, button presses, or other tokens. Here we visualize some of the data used to train the agent, and we will go into more detail on the training data in the data section. So now onto the model. We need to serialize different data modalities to convert them into a unified format so they are compatible with our model. We serialize continuous values differently depending on if they are observations or actions. Observations are first Mulan coded before discretizing the floats into integers. Actions, on the other hand, skip the Mulan coding and are directly discretized into integers. These integers are then used as keys to look up vectors in a learnable embeddings table. Finally, the observation and embedding vectors are concatenated together and local position encodings are added to them, which I'll explain in the next slide. This is the process for a single environment time step. Multiple time steps are concatenated together to form a trajectory, which is what we use as input data during training. To calculate local position encodings, we assign a local position index to each observation embedding vector. This index is its relative index within the environment time step. These position indices are then used to look up learnable position encodings, which are added to the observations. It's important to note that we do not add local position encodings to actions. To serialize images, we convert each image into a series of non-overlapping 16 by 16 patches. Each patch is processed by ResNet, which produces embedding vectors. We add patch positional encodings, which I'll discuss in the following slide, to these embedding vectors and concatenate them with actions as described in the previous slide on features. In this example, the action is already a discrete integer, so it doesn't need to be discretized and we can directly retrieve its embedding vector. Patch position encodings are similar to relative position encodings, but they operate over a two-dimensional space. First, the relative row and column intervals of the patch are calculated by normalizing the patch's pixel values at pixel intervals by image resolution. The row and column normalized intervals are then quantized into a vocabulary size, we use 128, and are used as ind to index a row and column table of learnable position encodings. The method in which we quantize the row and column values um, depends on whether we are training or evaluating the model. During training, a random index is uniformly sampled from the quantized interval, while during evaluation, we deterministically take the rounded mean of the interval. Once row and column positions are, encodings are retrieved from the embeddings table, they're added into the token embeddings produced by the ResNet embedding function, as previously described. For text, we use a sentence piece tokenizer to tokenize the text, and then look up embeddings for each token. This is really identical to how most transformer-based language models process text, and if you're familiar with that, then you'll also be familiar with the way we, we handle it. Finally, here's an example where we have image, text observations, and discrete actions. Let's see how things, things are put together. All the observation embeddings are concatenated first before being concatenated with the action embeddings. Finally, a full episode sequence is constructed by repeating this process for each time step. So moving on to the model itself. The Gato model uses a standard decoder-only transformer with a couple of notable differences. We use layer norm before the attention layer instead of afterwards, and use relative position encodings. We also use Geglu activations and stochastic depth during training. During training, we use mini batches that mix data from different multimodal data sources. We found it important to carefully tune the sampling weights for the, the uh, training data sets. 
data from each source is serialized, as described previously, before being concatenated together to form a mini-batch. The GATO model is trained to predict discretized actions. To create training targets, we right shift the input data and mask out observations. As a side note, I'd like to point out that we do not actually have to mask out observations. However, at the moment, predicting image targets is impossible using ResNet image serialization because we don't generate discrete image tokens. We train GATO to minimize the negative log likelihood of the training targets which is a standard formulation that's commonly used by transformer language models. We can also use GATO for inference. If desired, we prepend a fixed prompt to the model's context window. And at the beginning of the episode, we take the first observation, which is concatenated to this prompt if we have it. We then obtain the first action from the model and the second observation from the environment. The first action and the second observation are appended to the first observation and we continue to sample actions from the model and get observations from the environment. Now I'll talk about the data sets we use for training and fine tuning. GATO uses large and diverse data sets for pre-training. Here we've aggregated them into three broad categories, simulated control tasks, vision and language data sets, and real robot tasks. We collected data for the simulated control tasks by training state-of-the-art RL agents and recording the data they produce while learning the task at hand. For vision and language tasks, we use standard data sets that cover a range of tasks from image classification to text generation. The real robot stacking data came from the RGB stacking robotics benchmark. Zooming into the simulated control tasks, we can see we have environments with visual observations, proprioceptive features, and text instructions. In total, our datasets contain 62 million episodes with oh, almost 1.5 trillion tokens. Similarly to control, we train on a wide range of vision and language tasks. Our vision and language datasets can be split into two categories, datasets that contain either vision or language and datasets that contain both vision and language. And we here you can see them listed in this slide. We also constructed several out of distribution few shot datasets for control tasks. To do so, we selected the best 2000 episodes per out of distribution task. We then hierarchically subsampled 1000, 100, 10, 5, 3, and 1 episodes from these 2000 using three distinct seeds. This hierarchical subsampling ensures that for a single seed, all episodes in a smaller subset will be present, present in the larger sets. I'll now pass off to Jackie, who will discuss our results. Next, we'll present our results and analyze GATO's performance on in and out of distribution tasks. We evaluated the model on over 600 simulated tasks, the RGB stacking benchmark for real world robotics, and qualitatively evaluated it on its image captioning and dialogue capabilities. This plot shows the number of in distribution tasks where GATO's performance exceeds the score of the expert who gathered the data. GATO exceeds 50% of the expert score on 75% of the tasks. The model that produced these results is the canonical 1.18 billion parameter GATO. We analyzed the benefit of scaling the number of parameters and the amount of data by plotting the number of tokens processed against the mean normalized score. So the x-axis in the previous slide is now the y-axis. We trained 79 million 364 million and 1.18 billion parameter variants of GATO and observed that the biggest model had the best performance for the same number of tokens seen in training. To understand GATO's ability to generalize to unseen environments, we evaluated it on four holdout tasks, each from a different domain. For each task, we selected small subsets of a varying number of episodes and fine-tuned GATO on each subset in order to understand how well GATO can adapt to these new domains. 364 million parameter variant was used for the sake of saving compute. We compared fine-tuning the model trained on all in-distribution data to several other baselines. The no control data baseline is pre-trained on data from text and image datasets only, but no RL episodes. The same domain only data baseline 
is pre-trained on data from the same domain as the holdout task, and the from scratch baseline has no pre-training at all. These are the fine-tuning results for carpool swing up from the DeepMind control suite from state, so no pixel observations are present. Including data from other domains besides the control suite adds a significant benefit. For MetaWorld assembly, the inclusion of other data from the MetaWorld domain is important, and adding all control data gives a small boost in the 10 to 100 episode regime. This task and the previous one, Carpool Swing Up, don't require pixel or language processing, so it makes sense that the no control data baseline does poorly in both since it only includes image and language data. The DMLab Apple foraging task includes pixel observations, so the no control data baseline appears to learn useful visual priors for fine tuning, but the best results come from either the same domain data or all data. Finally, there is no real benefit for pre-training on data for Atari boxing. We hypothesize this is because the task is visually distinct from many of the other games in the training data set. Next, we'll show how Gato performs on real-world robotics tasks. We evaluated Gato on the RGB stacking robotics benchmark. The goal is to stack the red object on top of the blue one in the presence of a distractor green object. The object shapes vary such that some objects are much harder to grasp than others for the robot's parallel gripper. There are two tasks in this benchmark, skill mastery and skill generalization. Skill mastery is an in-distribution test. The training set of objects is the same as the test set, which is a limited set of five object triplets. Skill generalization is an out-of-distribution test. The robot is trained on a wide variety of object shapes that does not include the test set triplets. And here the test set is the same as the skill mastery train and test set. The Soyo robot typically runs at 20 Hertz or 50 milliseconds per time step, otherwise performance for control starts to degrade. Naively running the 1.18 billion parameter model on the existing setup is slower than this real-time rate. So we devised some improvements to run Gato on the real robot. We sampled the five action tokens in parallel instead of sequentially to reduce the overhead of sampling during evaluation. We reduced the attention context of our model and very importantly, we used faster GPUs, NVIDIA RTX 3080s. After optimizing for speed, we evaluated Gato on the skill mastery benchmark on the real robot. We matched the performance of the BC imp baseline from the original RGB stacking paper. For some object groups, like the most difficult group one, we underperformed the baseline, while for groups three, four, and five, we exceed the baseline. We then moved on to skill generalization, which meant switching our training data to the more diverse skill generalization training set. We first tested the benefits of scaling the model in simulation. The RGB stacking paper provided two baselines, behavior cloning and critic regularized regression, an offline RL technique. Both were trained on 500 episodes. We can outperform behavior cloning with just one demonstration match expert performance with 10, and we get close to the CRR baseline with 100 demos or more. Pretty impressive considering that we do not use offline RL, only imitation learning. The largest model clearly performs the best in the low data regime. The, result, the results for transfer are, correspond well on the real robot. You can see that the initial zero shot performance is around 45%. It goes up and it reaches expert performance with as little as 10 episodes and even exceeds expert performance due to data filtering around 1000. In addition to the canonical RGB stacking tasks, we tested Gato's generalization capability to a novel task where the goal is to stack the blue object on the green object. In all of the pre-training data, the robot stacks the red object on the blue object and doesn't even interact with the green object. So this is an in-domain task transfer challenge. We fine-tuned Gato on 500 teleoperated demonstrations of the blue on green task. We augmented it with simulation data of an agent doing the same task with different objects, and we achieved 51% success rate when evaluated on the real robot. 
In addition to its achievements on these tasks, Gato has rudimentary natural language capabilities. On the left, we show Gato prompted to caption images, describing the first several held out images from the MS Coco captioning dataset without cherry picking. On the right are samples from prompting Gato as a dialogue agent. Usually Gato replies with a relevant response, but it is often superficial or factually incorrect, which could likely be improved with further scaling. We made visualizations to qualitatively understand how Gato processes information from different domains. This slide shows a TSNE clustering of Gato's embeddings at layer 12, halfway down the transformer depth. Each data point is colorized by the task of the embedded observation. Tasks from the same domain cluster neatly together with, with some interesting outliers. For example, Multimodal Massive Web M3W is a text and image data set, so it overlaps significantly with Massive Text, a text only data set, but it also clusters near the RGB stacking tasks. To understand what Gato attends to, we took the transformer attention weights at layer zero and visualized the self-attention over the corresponding image patches. Gato attends to salient regions in the image, such as the robot embodiment, the character belonging to the player, the score in Atari, and tools like the ball in Breakout and Pong or the blocks in robotics. Attention visualization could be useful for diagnosing generalization issues. For example, why does the robot attend to the green block when it's not relevant to the task, which is to stack red on blue? Or why in boxing does it not appear to attend at all to one of the characters? In the spirit of transparency, we'll go over some of the limitations of Gato. Gato requires a large scale imitation data set, but this is a known limitation of offline imitation learning and improvements from offline RL could potentially be applied here. Gato's context length is limited to 1024 tokens, which limits the possibility of in-context learning. This is why we used fine tuning with gradient descent instead of prompting. Especially for tasks with large image observations, we can only fit a partial trajectory as a prompt. The context length is even more limited when we have to run in real time for the robotics tasks. We'll need to solve fast inference for large models in a more principled way if we want to scale to even larger model sizes. And finally, we're concerned about the safety of these models when it comes to foundation models and generalizations like Gato. And we hope that techniques like interpretability, visualization, and others will help us understand their potential harms. Thanks so much for listening. And if you have questions, feel free to drop us a line. We look forward to hearing from you.